Well, good morning. Thank you for inviting me. It was just uh, 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 Dirk and Karen invited us over to their house, and in their conversation, they, I ended up getting invited to speak here this Sunday. So thank you so much. Now, my wife Joyce is here, and uh, it was a very hot day in uh, August 16th, 1986, when we got married here in Phoenix. And uh, so uh, we might be new to some of you, I don't know, but we are not new to Phoenix. Uh, and Joyce is, I think your family, this Joyce's mother and sister, uh, Joyce's mother was a missionary with the same mission. Our mission is called Things to Come Mission, uh, based in Indianapolis. and. Uh, uh, Llewellyn was, and her husband, uh, Cliff, they were missionaries with TCM in Kenya for uh, seven years, I think it was, uh, with us as well. So Joyce and I actually met here in Phoenix, all in 1986. We met, we married, and we went to the mission field, Kenya. We were pioneer missionaries for our mission in Kenya. We were there 18 years. Our three uh, daughters were all uh, born there, and now one of our daughters, Tegwin, and her husband, Rabi, they are now missionaries in Kenya themselves. Uh, they've been there four or five years, and they're planning uh, in a couple more years, they're hoping to help us open a new work in Ethiopia. And I'll be talking more about that country later on. So it's uh, always good to come back. I do not know why we come back in the summer. It seems <laughs> like uh, winter is much more enjoyable here, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, because I, I come, I'm the international director of Things to Come Mission, so we live outside of the U.S. We are, it's required with that position. And we split our time between Manila, Philippines, and a place near Nairobi, Kenya, because we have work going on around uh, both of those uh, countries. And so we, uh, I'm, I come back to one board meeting a year. I'm supposed to meet face-to-face -face with the board in Indianapolis. And uh, so... We uh, usually choose the September meeting uh, as uh, I don't like to be in Indianapolis in the winter. Of course, I don't want to be here in the summer. But no. <laughs> so it's one of those trade-offs, you know, the this, this snowbird thing, I guess. But, uh, uh, but anyway, this is the time that uh, I usually come September. So it's great to uh, see all of you again. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for standing strong for the message of God's grace here in uh, uh, West Valley uh, Grace Fellowship. Um, Joyce and I are very committed to uh, the grace message and proclaiming that grace message and planting grace churches. Uh, that is the uh, central purpose of our organization. That comes from Paul because Paul was a church planter in his 13 epistles. Nine are written to churches and the other four are men who were very closely connected to local churches. The, the, the books written to individuals. Um, like Timothy, Titus, and Philemon, they were all involved uh, with uh, Timothy in the uh, church in Ephesus, Titus in Crete, and uh, Philemon in Colossae. So they were very connected to a local grace fellowship. And so I just want to say thank you for standing uh, uh, in the ministry of Paul, but then uh, that's also what we do in, in our mission field. When we go to a country, target a people, yes, we tell them the good news of God's grace, but those who believe, we always form them. Try, I mean, we do our best to form them into a worshiping community, a, a church, a congregation of believers who meets regularly. And so uh, we, uh, like in Philippines, that was our biggest field. We have, and we don't send missionaries there anymore because it's all run by the Filipinos. And we have about 550 Grace churches there, about eight uh, resident Bible schools, radio programs all over the country. And they run all of that themselves now. We have turned the work over to them, but they are partners with us. We work very closely together. In fact, TCM just bought a mission house in Manila, and that's where Joyce and I stay when we are there. So it's nice to be back and to tell you a little about what we're doing, and I'll be talking about some of the countries uh, where we do go. Um, but just to say thank you. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your interest and your partnership in our mission. Um, We'll, uh, uh, mission is the idea of sending the gospel, as we will see. And uh, yes, we want everyone around us to know Jesus Christ. Uh, but we, what about the people on the other side of the world? Should they know Jesus Christ too? Or Jesus is only for 
people living in Phoenix. I mean, I think uh, everyone needs to know Jesus Christ. And that's our goal, is that we can take the gospel to another people where Jesus Christ has never been preached before. And praise the Lord, he's given us that opportunity many, many times. Um, the last year was a bit rough. Uh, two years ago, the COVID times, that was one of the hardest times of my life because in the Philippines, they shut us down totally. We not only had to wear a mask, we had to wear a face shield, this plastic shield, both. And it's a very hot and humid country. And usually there was sweat running down or condensation running down the inside of the plastic face shield. And Joyce and I felt like we were in prison. Uh, the, I think the straw that broke the camel's back was one time we entered our apartment complex and they'd set up this plastic booth and you had to stand there and they took this industrial sprayer and sprayed you on one side. Then you had to turn around so they could spray you on the other side. Uh, so it really felt like prison um, for, those, for that time. And uh, we actually that's what caused us to kind of leave the Philippines for about a year. And we switched to Kenya where things were more, we were able to do ministry in Kenya. Uh, but uh, praise the Lord, those days are, are over and we actually have so many opportunities now for ministry. In fact, it's always the, the workers, the personnel that, uh, who can go out and help us take the gospel out because somebody has to speak the gospel. And uh, it's, there's millions, there's, they say about three billion people who have not heard the gospel clearly. And so that's gonna take a lot of ministers, a lot of missionaries. And that's our task really right now. We are very much involved in training other people to do what we've done these uh, past 38 years uh, since we've been in ministry. Um, you know, the, the best way of communicating the gospel is person to person. I mean, we use all the tools available to us. We have a website, we have a Facebook page, we, have, we use Zoom. I mean, we have a paid Zoom account that's in use all the time. But you know, nothing uh, beats going there and seeing people and shaking their hand. And you know, I, I assume it's, it would be, it's more meaningful to you that Joyce and I are sitting here uh, with Joyce's mom and sister than if I just sent you a video and say, well, just uh, watch this video, you'll know what we're doing. You know, and that's exactly what Jesus did, isn't it? The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, right? Why? He used the Bible. Why didn't just God just leave us with the Bible? Never mind the Word. But the Word did become flesh and live among us. Yes, He died for us, but that took, what, one day, three days to die, buried, and resurrection. He could have come for three days and done that. But Jesus was born in a manger. He grew up among the people. People saw Him growing up among them. And He, he talked to them. He lived with them. Uh, he made friends with them for three years. He had ministry with them. And so this, uh, the word becoming flesh, I call this incarnational ministry. Uh, and that's what we believe in in Thanks to Come Mission, that we actually train missionaries and real live Christians go and live among the people with, with all that that entails, with all the difficulty that is there. Um, we send people to live in those places, get a visa, figure out how to stay there, learn the difficult language, eat a different food, different culture, different climate, because this is how God did it, by sending Jesus. And so this is how we also, the best way to communicate the gospel. Now we use other means also. I mean, we have our websites and our tracks and our online lessons and online Bible schools, uh, but you know, nothing beats a, a real life person there among them, um, becoming friends with them and sharing in their difficulties and their joys. Uh, be, uh, that is where uh, the ministry, the gospel really transfers from one to the other. And so last year I traveled 200 days. Uh, I counted them actually. So I was on the road, but you know, and that's part of going, right? If uh, my, the title of my message is from uh, what Paul, Paul described his calling, go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. But that idea of go, and when I travel, I'm going because I'm in charge of 16 countries outside of the U.S. and we're targeting two, two new countries right now. And so that involves going to people, 
And so that's why uh, we do the traveling. Joyce travels with me sometimes, but then uh, she's also very involved with uh, our Bible school in Kenya. We have a, a really nice school with uh, where Rob, have Robbie and Tegman, our, our daughter, have they been here? I'm not sure, but I, some of you have met them, I think. Um, but they are uh, very involved in the Bible school ministry in Kenya. And sometimes we have four different programs going at the same time at that Bible school. We're still working on completing all the buildings for it, but we have a very nice facility there now in Thika, Kenya, about 45 minutes from Nairobi, the capital city. And so Joyce, uh, we, we rent a house about 10 minutes walk from that Bible school, and that's where we live uh, when I'm home. And then Joyce very involved in the Bible school in uh, ministries in Kenya, and she also teaches online uh, Bible courses. Uh, I know Indonesia is one of her big ones. She regularly teaches to our ministry. We have about 70 Grace churches in Indonesia. <coughs> it's the largest Muslim country in the world. In fact, next year, I'm not sure if anyone's interested, but uh, we have our Southeast Asia Grace Conference will be in Indonesia next year on the island of Java, the most populated island in the world. And uh, it will be in the city of Jog, Jakarta. Okay? Jakarta is the big city. Uh, they're actually moving the capital out of Jakarta now, but Jog, Jakarta is where our Southeast Asia Conference will be, July 24 uh, through 28 um, next year. Uh, so um, uh, Joyce uh, travels with me sometimes, and our re most recent ministry was training missionaries in the Philippines. We have our own missionary training school in TCM. In fact, we have given it the clever acronym GTCM. So, Grace Theological Center for Mission. And uh, we train nine more for two months in uh, June and July. And then, uh, of course, there's other teachers besides us. And then the, uh, uh, we have now have trained 57, as I calculate, 57 new missionaries through that training that started in 2015. And many, I'd say half of those are now on the field. In fact, uh, this month we'll have our TCM board meeting in Indianapolis and we will be submitting five new applications for missionaries. Um, we're going to three different countries. And so that training has been very effective in uh, raising up people who can go out and uh, work with TCM. And according to our goals, because you know, mission can be defined in various ways. But in TCM, we seek to um, uh, prepare people according to the methods of Apostle Paul, because Paul says, I'm the apostle to the Gentiles. So we look at how he did it. What did he do? What did he seek to accomplish when he went to all these Gentile nations? And we seek to do the same thing in our mission. And so to do that, we train people and say, this is how Paul did it. This is how our mission did it and does it. And this is how we want you to do it when we send you out to the field. So we're very thankful for those uh, five who have filled out their applications and will be joining TCM soon. I want, I want to share a bit from the Bible too, but uh, um, my first point is this, the gospel must be sent to those who must hear. The gospel must be sent to those who must hear. Sometimes you wonder where the word mission comes from. It's not really a word in the Bible as such, okay? The way we use the word mission. And then you see organizations and schools today have a mission statement on the wall. That is really something a little different also. The word mission as we use it in our churches, mission comes from a Latin word mito, and mito means to send. So the idea of a mission is that you're sending someone with a message. Okay, And, and it's a common concept in the Bible, of course. Uh, we, we take two words like apostle in, in uh, Greek, uh, apostolos, and uh, uh, angel. Those both have the idea of sending someone with a message, to communicate a message to someone else, even prophet, right? A prophet spoke the word of God to the people. And so this concept of sending somebody to accomplish something or speak a message to somebody, it's just in the Bible from the beginning to the end. And so the idea of that mission has the idea of sending the message to another people. And so this is what we uh, seek to do. Some examples I'll give in the Bible, there's probably a hundred, but uh, Moses, for example, here's one from uh, Exodus 3. 
Uh, you know, God appeared to Moses in the burning bush. Not really a burning bush. It looked like it was burning, but it wasn't. But uh, God appeared to him and says, I am going to rescue my people. I see the oppression they're facing in Egypt, and they, I, I'm going to take them out of there. And Moses was very happy about God's plan to take them out. And then what did God say? God said this, so now go. Remember that word go, G-O? I, I, the title of my message also says, go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. He, God said to Moses, so now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Well, at that point, uh, Moses says, well, your plan was good up to now, but now your plan is bad, okay, because you put me into it, right? And I know my weaknesses and my failures. I am not part of your plan to rescue your people. In fact, uh, it's interesting when God first called him uh, at the burning bush, he said, uh, here I am, right? But after God told him, okay, Moses, go, that's when he said, who am I, right? So it went from here I am to who am I? And uh, of course, then God convinced him that yes, Moses, you are going to go, actually, even though you say you can't do the work, you are going to go. And uh, then, uh, of course, God gave, explained what his name is, the Yahweh or Jehovah, um, the I am who I am. So it went from here I am to who am I, to God saying I am who I am, meaning I am eternally present. I will be with you wherever you are. I will be there. I am there. And that's the God that we serve. And he is with us. I always tell our missionaries, you're going to these unreached people. God's already there. He knows those people intimately. He cares about them. He loves them. And so you're not going to be left high and dry out there. He's going to help you to accomplish the ministry he's called you to do. And so that's what Moses needed to learn. That he wasn't going alone to Pharaoh. God was going with him, working with him. But he was an agent to do the work that God wanted him to do. And praise the Lord, uh, uh, Moses did go. Another one, Isaiah, I think we're all familiar with this. Uh, then Isaiah, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, what did Isaiah answer? Here am I, send me. Right? A little different response than Moses, right? Who said, who am I? Uh, here, um, Isaiah directly answered, here I am. Here I am, send me. I am willing to do it. You ask me, and I will do it. I will go. And so uh, that was a, a different response. But again, we see, well, God, why don't you just go and do it yourself? Like shout from heaven or rearrange the stars so they form the message that you want those people to, to read. So every night they see the message, right? But God says, no. What, what, what was his statement? Um, uh, whom shall I send and who will go for us? So God says, no, we are not going. We are going to send somebody else. And so Isaiah was the one who was sent. And he was, of course, a great prophet of God. He spoke the words of God to the people. And this is how God works. He worked that way uh, throughout the Bible, and he's still working that way today. He is sending people with the wonderful message of Jesus Christ, the message of God's grace, that Jesus paid it all on the cross of Calvary. He's still sending people out to preach that message. And then, of course, uh, we have uh, Jesus and, and the disciples um, who, um, as the Father has sent me, so I'm sending you. See the use of the word send two times there. As the Father sent me. Jesus claimed that somebody else sent him to earth. Right? That's what he's saying. As the Father sent me. I just didn't wake up one morning and come down here. Somebody sent me down here to be with you people. And that somebody is the God the Father in heaven. And God said, go. And I went. And I'm here. And I know that it's all going to end when I die on that cross. And I'm ready for it because that's the purpose for which I came down here. And so Jesus was sent. And as Jesus was sent, he says, I am sending you disciples as I'm about to leave. You know, he died and, you know, a few weeks later he ascended. And, but he left 
you know, apostles to do the work that he had assigned them to do. And then later, of course, he called Apostle Paul to take this message, the message to the Gentiles. Um, and then, of course, the passage I've just given you, uh, Acts 22:21. 21. Uh, then the Lord said to me, go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Now, what makes that, that statement significant? Uh, what Paul says, go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Okay, we need to understand, Paul identified as a Jew. We talk about identity these days so much in our society, but Paul identified as a Jew, and I'll show it to you uh, in Romans 9, 3, and 4. Now listen to what he says. For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people, those of my own race, the people of Israel. That's Paul's words. He was willing to be accursed by Christ for what he called my people, right? That's what he says. So he identified, then he says, uh, theirs is the adoption to sonship, theirs the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, and the promises. So he's talking about um, the, the, the people of Israel, those people God chose way back when he chose Abraham and said, go to the land I will show you and I'll make you into a great nation. And so Paul identified with them. And so what's interesting is every time Paul talks about Gentiles and uh, he is talking about mission. He is a Jew being sent to another people that he doesn't identify with. They are, what he would not call them my people. I mean, I'm a Gentile. My name's Benjamin, but I'm not Jewish. I am Gentile. And uh, Paul was a Jew and he identified with the Jews. So when he went to Gentiles, he was doing mission. He was going to another people than his own. I mean, I'm sure he would have loved to stay there in Israel where everyone knew the, you know, all about the law and the culture and the food and the, the yearly holidays and rituals. I'm sure he felt comfortable with all that. He'd been doing it his whole life. But God said, no, no, you are not going to do that, Paul. Go, go, I am sending you far away, far away. To the Gentiles and this is what mission is and you know our missionaries still struggle with this uh, uh, sometimes they this idea of being sent far away to the Gentiles I, before I go on I just mention that Paul uses about one-third of the uses of the word Gentile are in the book of Romans about 31 uses 102 in the New Testament 31 are in Romans Paul's epistles account for 56 uses uh, Hebrews through Revelation, one time. The word Gentile appears one time in Hebrews through Revelation. Paul uses it 56 times in his epistles. That should tell us something. And this was his mission. This was what he was sent to do. And so we see this willingness. I love my people. I'm willing to be cursed. I want them to believe. I mean... And we feel that way. We're Americans. We spend most of our life in other countries. I've 38 years of our lives. Well, we lived in Indianapolis while I was executive director. But most of our lives have been outside of the U.S. And we love the U.S. The U.S. has been the greatest force for mission there's ever been since Jesus Christ was on this earth. There is no greater force for mission than our country. I mean, the number of missionaries who have gone out, the mission organizations, the mission training schools, the seminaries, the, I mean, we have been, I mean, the force to be reckoned with for Jesus Christ. But I will tell you, things change over time, don't they? I mean, uh, I think some of us in this room have hair my color, right? Uh, we're, we're older, we remember what it was maybe 50 years ago or so, and we see things changing. You know, we, in fact, in our mission, it's difficult for us now to get American missionaries. Most of our missionaries do come from what were former mission fields are now sending missionaries themselves, which is the way it should be, because we're all the body of Christ and we all have work to do. But this, uh, 
Uh, my prayer for our country is that we have revival and we have this passion and this willingness like, like these people who were sent. Here am I, Lord, send me. Do we still have Americans who are willing to say that? You know, um, or, you know, we have, of course we have fears. We all the stories of the Muslims killing and the terrorists and all that. But are we willing to go because God loves them and they need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, you know? And so I pray more Americans will answer that call in this way, just like Paul did. You know, when God said, go, I'm sending you far away to the Gentiles. He didn't stay in Jerusalem. He didn't stay in Tarsus, which was his hometown. He went. The Macedonian vision. He had that dream at that night, and that was uh, the Macedonians in Europe. He was in the continent of Asia. He got that vision, and the next morning he got up and he took the gospel to Europe. How important is that, that the gospel of Jesus Christ went to Europeans? I don't know where you come from in the world, but I'm, I'm Anderson and my mother was Carlson. Okay, so you know I'm a Scandinavian, right? And that's Europe. And Paul took the gospel to Macedonia and established the gospel in Europe. Our granddaughter's name is Lydia. Lydia was the first European who believed in Jesus Christ. Thank God that Paul says, yes, I will go, and I will go immediately and start preaching the gospel to Europeans. And that's what happened when he left the, Tro the shores of Troas uh, after having that vision at night. Uh, praise the Lord for him that he had that response. Talk a bit about, um, you might think, well, Filipinos, it's easier for them to go. But I have sent Filipino missionaries, and they struggle just the same as any of us do with a new language and a new culture and new food and new climate. Uh, we're sending a mission. We're trying to get started right now in Ethiopia. Uh, we've already registered an organization with the government called Things to Come Mission Ethiopia. And so with that, we're hoping to bring more missionaries, get them work permits so they can stay in the country and do the ministry. And so uh, our, our missionaries, Reagan and Jemima Mejia, uh, Mejia spelled M-E-J-I-A, uh, they were trained by us in our missionary training school in 2015. But when they finished, we, none of us felt they were ready to go yet. I mean, he seemed confused, not, not confused, but he wasn't sure what he wanted to do with his life. So he says, well, why don't you wait a while and make sure that you are called to leave your people, leave the people you love and go to another people, make sure you're ready. And so we left uh, and he went off, he planted a new grace church in the Philippines. He pastored a large and growing church in the Philippines. Uh, Grace, our churches there are called Grace Gospel Church of Christ, and he, he pastored a church, and then he came to us uh, about two years ago and says, my wife and I have prayed, and this is the time. We're ready to be missionaries. And uh, so we accepted them, and I think I made some enemies in the Philippines because they really like him, like Reagan. Uh, how can you not like someone named Reagan? But, oh, yeah. <laughs> Let's not get political here. But, um, but you know, the, um, he, uh, they made that decision leaving a very good ministry where people love them, really love them. And, uh, but he says, you know, I know there's places where they're, they don't know the gospel of grace, where there are not a single grace church, where the, a clear gospel of salvation is never preached to the people. I've got, we have to go. And so they took their two kids and uh, they came to Kenya for six months. And then now they've gone to Ethiopia and it hasn't been easy. Ethiopia, Addis Ababa is a city at 7,000 feet. Okay, so it is cold at night. Philippines, you're sweating all the time. Addis, a lot of the year you're wearing a jacket because it's so cold there. Um, it's high altitude, of course, rather than sea level. But I think he struggled, one of the things he struggled with uh, was their main food is called jera. Jera, they make this bread, big bread on a, like a tray. And uh, it's kind of, it's thin but spongy and it's fermented for three days. Okay, so it's sour through the fermenting process. Okay, so 
they have that, then they put different vegetables on there, and then you tear <laughs> off a piece and roll it up in the vegetables and pop it in your mouth. And uh, yeah, it's not the flavor you're used to, you know, from, <laughs> from the Philippines for sure. And so when I did the survey with him, I think he was really struggling with uh, uh, eating that food, but uh, because he'd never eaten it before. But he wrote to me um, recently and he says, well, I went to visit my friend and we ate jera together. So he's now adjusting his taste buds, adjusting what he thinks food should taste like, because this is what these people eat. And if you're gonna reach those people, you have to eat what they're eating. And, uh, you know, Jesus ate with people, right? He ate with the tax collectors and the sinners. You eat together as you share the gospel. And our missionaries have to eat together with the local people in order to share the gospel with them. And you might think, this is not food, and I hate the taste, but you do it, and you will do it because God loves those people, you love them, and you're willing to eat their food. And so he's doing that, he's adjusting. So he and his wife uh, are there adjusting. They have a place to live. We're still working on getting their work permit and I would ask your prayer for uh, Reagan and Jemima uh, that they can get that work permit so that they can stay there. We also have Fikra who is our Ethiopian contact, knows the grace message, loves the grace message. And he's also working with us to try to establish our, our Grace Church there. Now, the Mahias want to learn the Amharic language. So for one year, uh, now when they get their visa, they will study the Amharic language. And that doesn't use our alphabet. So you have to learn another alphabet uh, first also. So, and then, uh, of course, their kids are homeschooled. Keziah and Dale. Keziah is 10, I think. And Dale is seven, I believe. Uh, and they will have to study the language. So, they're being sent. Part of their support comes from the Philippines. They spent six months visiting the Grace Churches in the Philippines. And then we and TCM pay two -thirds, give two-thirds of their support so that they can be in Ethiopia. And we uh, thank you for being a part of that process. Uh, second point I want to make is this. Workers must be raised up who are ready to be sent. Um, remembering Jesus' statement. He was walking with his disciples. He says, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few, right? There are people, there are places we can potentially preach the gospel. We can talk to people. We can do the work of God. But what's lacking? Workers, right? The workers are few. Now, this is Jesus' statement. Ask the Lord of the harvest not to harvest the field. You know, we could pray, Lord, harvest all of those people in, you know, Nepal. Uh, no, it doesn't work that way. Um, what does he say? Ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers, workers into his harvest field. God works through people. We in the body of Christ. Jesus is the head. We are the members of the body. We do the work and he tells us what to do. The head instructs the body. And so this is how God's doing his work in our world today. And so that's a, a big part of our work is training people who are ready to go. Uh, reminding you of uh, this verse also, are these workers ready to sacrifice? Uh, Romans uh, 12, 1 and 2. Therefore I urge your brothers in view of God's, brothers and sisters in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as living sacrifices. Um, I know sometimes we shy away from that word sacrifice, but every one of us in this room is willing to sacrifice for something. Every one of us is willing and has sacrificed. Something you felt was valuable, you sacrificed for it. You put hours and hours of labor, you spent money, you traveled across the country, you sacrificed for something in your life. And every one of us is willing to sacrifice if we feel something is valuable enough. And we have to decide for ourselves, are the lost souls of men and women, are they valuable enough for us to live a, be a living sacrifice, to give up? I mean, Joyce was a certified school teacher teaching here in Phoenix, just bought her first house when she met me. And 
She felt the call of mission. She saw the need on the mission field and she gave up that life. And for 38 years, we've been doing the ministry of mission. We could have lived here in Phoenix for 38 years, living, you know, working here. But we gave that up because we saw there was a need somewhere else that we could meet. And we felt God's call in our lives personally to do something about it. So we did. And so that's why we have come to this point in our lives and ministry. Um, going on, of course, uh, present your body, off your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your uh, true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. That's a real struggle, isn't it? Um, I've seen myself, the world presses in on us. Sometimes instead of us changing the world, the world changes us. Um, and so don't conform to the pattern of this world. Um, and I always tell our missionaries, it's abnormal to be a missionary. Okay, I don't know if they like to hear that, but I tell them that before they go. It's abnormal to be, most people stay home. They stay close to mom and dad and brother and sister, right? It's abnormal to leave all that and go to another people that are not your people. And so, uh, but this is what it's saying. Don't conform to the world standards, uh, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will know, then you'll be able to uh, um, test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Of course, we have our own will. God has his will. Whose will is going to win, right? I mean, that's a choice each one of us makes every day when we get up in the morning. Uh, whose will is going to rule this day? Whose will is going to be accomplished this day? My will or God's will? We all have to face that every day when we wake up. I'll just mention a, a country here, Nepal. Um, I made my first visit to Nepal. I had a friend I met on the internet and he would always invite me to speak on a Zoom meeting to a bunch of pastors. His name's Cam Dev, Pastor Cam Dev. And he's always telling me, we need TCM in Nepal. And I'm like, we have no plan to work in Nepal and we have nobody to work in Nepal. But I'll be happy to teach your Bible class. Well, eventually I was visiting our missionary in Bangkok and uh, Thailand. And so I said, you know, I have about five days here. I'm going to get on a plane and go to Nepal and meet my friend, Pastor Kamdev, and just see what Nepal is like. I've never been there. I mean, I've seen the videos of people climbing Mount Everest, but I'm sure that's not the normal life of the average Nepali citizen is climbing Mount Everest. So I wanted to meet the real people, the Nepali people. So I went over there. Now he lives in the southern part of the country. Um, so, you know, Kathmandu, Kathmandu, the, the capital is in the middle, kind of. And then the northern part is uh, mountainous. That's the part close to China. And then the southern part is flatland, low level flatland, very hot. So the north is very cold, south is very hot next to India. It's bordered just by two countries, China and India, the hu huge countries. And then uh, Nepal is there in the middle, I think about 30 million people. And uh, so I um, traveled there. I, uh, one interesting thing, when he rented a car, it was an electric car. And I noticed the electricity is always going off in that country. And in fact, we went somewhere and the car had to be charged. So while we're charging it, all the electricity goes off. And I'm like, well, now what? You know what I mean? So we just sat there telling stories to each other. Uh, the name, it was a Chinese car uh, uh, called BYD, uh, which, which they say is build your dream. Okay, build your dreams, I guess is the name, BYD. And now I know why, because when you're sitting there for those hours waiting for the electricity to come on, you have a lot of time to build your dream in your head, right? <laughs> But anyway, we, uh, we did make it around the country, uh, or at least the southern part. Uh, one interesting thing is I had to fly from Kathmandu to an uh, airport just uh, near the Indian border, a um, place called Simra, Simara, Simra. And uh, so I go to get on my plane and I'm riding on Buddha Air, right? So I was hoping my karma was good so that we could uh, make it. <laughs> but uh, we did there and back, Buddha Air, and, uh, but yes, the country, although they call it Buddha Air, the country is actually Hindu. Hindu is almost everybody in the country is Hindu. And uh, Christianity, 1.4%, 1.4%. 1 
one point for it. Most people don't even know what a Christian is. I mean, uh, most people have never heard of somebody named Jesus Christ. I went to past town after town, village after village that doesn't have one Christian or one church. That's what we call unreached people. See, unreached isn't that you're not saved. Unsaved is different. There's people who are unsaved and they don't want anything to do with Jesus Christ. They have rejected the Bible and God and Jesus Christ, right? So unreached means they don't have an opportunity to hear the gospel. There's no Christian in their community to tell them. That's what we mean by unreached. And so we have a concern to reach out to those people. Um, so we traveled around. Uh, uh, Pastor Kambev's wife's name is Kiran, and she told me her testimony. She wore, she, her clothes she wore looked like she was an Indian. She had the sari and, and all that. Uh, she looked very Indian. And her uh, relatives come from India across the border to Nepal. But she said she was 12 years old, watching TV, and she heard the gospel. Uh, and she believed the gospel. She trusted in Jesus Christ. And her parents were so angry with her because her entire family was Hindu. All. Mom, dad, uncles, aunts, brothers. They were pure Hindu family. And here's this little 12-year-old girl saying, Oh no, I, I'm a Christian. Je Jesus is my Savior. Well, that did not fly well with the family. And they were angry about it for all her teenage years. But the Holy Spirit was working through her and her testimony because when she was 20... Both her parents and her brothers and sisters and even some of her uncles and aunts trusted in Jesus Christ for their salvation. They left the, the Hindu. You know, Hindu have hundreds of gods, uh, but they left all that. And they says, no, Jesus is the only Savior. He died on the cross for our sins. And they trusted in him. And so now she's so happy because her family has trusted in Jesus Christ. But see, somebody had to communicate. Now, in her case, it was through TV. Praise the Lord. But someone had to communicate the gospel. And that's what they need. I am sure that of the 99% who don't know Christ in Nepal, if they could just hear about Jesus Christ and what he did for them and how much God loves them, there's people there who would believe. But we have to send somebody there to tell them. And this is what mission is, sending people with the gospel. And praise the Lord that... Right now, there's a couple. We train them in our missionary training. He's been a pastor for, I don't know, eight years. He's taught in one of our Bible schools. His name is Ralph, and uh, his wife's name is Renalyn, and uh, they are ready to go to Nepal. And they're, they're two, one, two of the applications we'll be giving at TCM in, in a couple weeks. There are two of them, and they're ready to go. Again, they have a great ministry in the Philippines. They have family in the Philippines. But when they heard of the need, 1.4%, these people don't hear the gospel. How can we stay here in the Philippines where there's Christians piled on top of each other? We're planting a new church every two weeks. And over there, they know nothing. How can I stay here? So this is a young couple. Uh, and they're around 30 years old. And they're ready to go. And so pray for that. Pray for us as we target uh, uh, that country. And then I want to, uh, my last point, my time's about up here, so we'll finish with this passage. Uh, what I call the Grace Commission. I don't argue with people about the great or greatest commission, but I call this the Grace Commission. Uh, 2 Corinthians uh, 5, 18 through 6, 2. But I'm not going to read the whole passage. I just want to look at 6, 1, and 2. Um, as you know, the chapter divisions in the Bible are not inspired. Those were put in there many years after the original author wrote the words of the text. Then someone came along later and put in chapter numbers and verse numbers, which helps us, of course, to see it. So anyway, there's a division there at 6, but 6, 1, and 2. As God's co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. I hope all of us here in this congregation have received God's grace. He loves us. Well, Jesus died on the cross while we were still sinners, and we've accepted that message of grace. But we shouldn't receive it in vain, meaning we keep it to ourselves, right? God's grace is for all, not just me, or not just Americans. I mean, it's for all people. 
So we shouldn't receive it in vain. vain. Then look at verse 2. It's a quote, actually. For he says, In the time of my favor I heard you, and in the day of salvation I helped you. That's an Old Testament quote. Then this is Paul's words again. I tell you, I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. You know, we, um, we uh, look at the events happening right now in Israel. And of course, those of us who are, uh, interpret the Bible dispensationally, we know that God has a future plan for Israel. And we kind of get alarmed like, whoa, what's going on? Because obviously the tribulation uh, is centered around Israel. And uh, we wonder what's going to happen. But praise the Lord, we're in the dispensation of grace, right? This is the day when God's pouring his grace out on the world. But if this is the day of grace, it means the day is coming that is not the day of grace. And read the book of Revelation. It talks about Satan's wrath. It talks about God's wrath. It talks about these terrible bowls being poured out on the earth and all this terrible suffering dropping down there on humanity. That's a day of judgment, a day of wrath. And that day will come. But that day is not today. Today is the dispensation of grace. It's the day of grace. It's the day of salvation. Today we can preach freely to people. God loves you. God wants you. God has a place for you. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. This is the time we need to be preaching that wonderful message while we still have time. You know, I'm looking forward to the rapture. I mean, uh, uh, to meet Jesus Christ face to face, I mean, will be fantastic. But then all, all of our loved ones who've gone before us, right? We'll meet them too. It's going to be a great day. But guess what? All the people who know Jesus Christ, the entire body of Christ is going to be gone from this world. There will be no more chance to tell anyone about Jesus Christ. It will end in a moment. And that's going to be a tough day for those who are still here trying to figure out what's going on. Okay, so um, today's the day of salvation. Um, so just uh, um, want to encourage you uh, about these two countries I've spoken of, Ethiopia and Nepal. These are countries we're working on right now and things to commission. As the international director, those are under my responsibility. So I'm working closely with those countries, those missionaries, those local people to try to establish our ministry in those countries. Um, just leave you with another verse that I love. Uh, that was my conclusion. Uh, well, I'll just review uh, the three points of my message again. Uh, the gospel must be sent to those who must hear. You have to hear the gospel before you can believe the gospel. Second, workers must be raised up who are ready to be sent. There's many believers who aren't called to be sent, you know, but others are, and we must raise them up and send them. Third, today is the day of salvation. A great verse which tells me, a, the only verse I know of that really sort of gives some order to what's going to happen in the future of the dispensation of grace, Romans 11, 25. I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery. See the word mystery there, right? Meaning Paul is telling us something new. This mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part. Okay, it's true. Today it's not Jews preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ today. It's Gentiles preaching Jesus. Um, Israel has been hardened in part until what? The full number, uh, some translations, fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And I believe that by doing mission, we're bringing the rapture closer. Because I don't know what that fullness is, but it has to be some people out there who need to hear this message. And so I believe that by going out there and doing mission, we're actually bringing the rapture closer because we're reaching this fullness of the Gentiles. And then, of course, if you go on, it says after that, then, after the rapture, God will continue his prophetic dealings uh, with Israel. So Apostle Paul, in, cl in closing, Apostle Paul was willing to leave his beloved people. He was willing to leave them. 
and he gave his life to reaching the Gentile people. And I just have to ask us, are we willing to leave our beloved America to reach the unreached people of our generation? And maybe you can't leave for whatever reason, uh, might be health-wise or other commitments, but you have someone going in your place to reach the unreached with this wonderful gospel of grace. So, thank you. Let us, okay? You want me to close the whole service? Okay. So I will close our service in prayer. Thank you. Our precious, precious Heavenly Father, thank you so much. What a wonderful message we have. It gives us hope. It gives us assurance. We know our future. We know our past. What a truly wonderful message we have. And yet, Lord, it's not just for us here. It's for all people need to hear this message. And thank you for allowing us to participate in your purpose for our people, for our world, that we are co-workers with you in taking this wonderful gospel out to the unreached. Thank you for this church, uh, West Valley Grace Fellowship. I pray you would uh, bless them, help them to stand strong for the truth here. Pray for Pastor Mark, that you would give him wisdom in all the messages that he preaches and the shepherding he does for the people. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.